Hello X, I have something to share with you that I can scarcely still believe myself, so I won't be offended if what I say isn't taken at face value, or if you have a lot of questions. It concerns a project that I was assigned to in the past couple of years. Now, don't get ahead of yourself. It wasn't some top secret CIA MKUltra experiment or anything crazy like that. I was actually assigned to collect data on some tunnel systems in the New York City subway system that has been abandoned for a long time, and which also linked to another tunnel system separated completely from the NYC subway system. I'm a scientist primarily, not a top researcher in my field, but good enough for the job, I suppose. Anyway, the U.S. government, or I should say, a company contracted by the U.S. government, subcontracted me in order to conduct this project for them over the course of the last 20 days' time in total. These events occurred around four years ago from this date. I will try in green text as much as I possibly can to make things easier to follow, but I'll also have to dump in a fair bit in regular text just to be able to type it all out in a timely manner. For the first two weeks or so of the project, I made minimal progress and felt like bashing my head against a wall and calling it quits, but little hints of information here and there encouraged me to persevere with the task at hand. Every time I felt like I had a lead, I was met with a brick wall, sometimes literally. I seriously wanted to head back, but here is one main reason why I did not. Assigned to the tunnels, had a limited amount of intel on the tunnels that I was investigating, but we did hear various rumors from people. Rumors of an ecosystem of homeless people occupying a vast amount of the tunnels, much deeper in, and that they possibly had their own tunnel network established that veered away from the NYC subway system. Was assigned to this task alone due to their research being relatively secret. Not top secret classified, but they did not want the public to be aware of what might be going on underneath them. While investigating some of the tracks deeper in, near the abandoned stations, I noticed something incredibly strange. Something that wasn't in any of the reports, and that we had not heard rumors about. There were these strange growths, growing on the tracks, and also hanging from the ceiling overhead. They were bulbous and meaty, and whenever you shone a torch on them, they would pulsate. Wasn't sure whether they were living beings or not, but we quickly nicknamed them mutants or subway mutants, just as a joke. The name was not intended to be serious at all. They were pretty easy to destroy. I managed to poke it with a relatively long wooden beam, and it popped like an egg yolk. It smelled worse than an egg too. Destroying the bulb would cause it to spew this horrible smelling slime everywhere across the tracks. The U.S. government had planned for a construction project in order to restore these stations and lines and eventually eject all of the homeless people that they could, but any construction could not begin until we had A. Got into the bottom of these mutants, and B. Found and infiltrated the homeless hideout so that we could get rid of them. Simple, really. My first plan of action was to become buddies with some of the homeless people around town and who hung around the subway stations to see if I could glean any information at all. My idea was that the homeless people not down below were probably outcast from their own homeless tunnels and would maybe hold a grudge and be willing to give up some information in return for some bribes. Alcohol and cigarettes, of course. I did just this with a few different homeless people and they told me about Sector 24. Supposedly, it was the name of a deeper part of the subway and their own tunnel system. It was considered forbidden territory for anyone not invited or anyone who was outcast. They told me that they had also encountered the same bulbous mutants as I had, but had stayed away from them out of instinct and had just as much information as I on what they were or how they grew. They only told me that they stink and to stay out of Sector 24 unless I have an invitation or a guide. I went down and set up a rudimentary base camp with all of the necessary provisions to survive for a few weeks just in case I found a lead and did not want to keep making the journey back to the surface. 
I made a few journal entries while I was down there about some of the things that I encountered, and so I will green text them for you now. Once I have green texted them, I will share the rest of the story after those. Entry 1 is a brief description about my encounter with the Bulba subway mutants that I encountered both on the tracks and saw hanging from the ceiling of the subway and tunnels. Mostly appear as fleshy bulbous growths and seem to only appear where it is humid. Their sizes can vary dramatically depending on the area that I encountered them in. Conducting an inspection as normal, came upon a massive section of them all close together. A massive group of them had completely overrun a small room-like section on one of the passageways. The entire room was just pulsating with them. It looked as if they were all breathing in and out, in tune with each other. Each one also had very tiny hairs on them that were very hard to see unless they had light shining on them. It's possible that they were tiny feelers that they used or possibly something else. Seemed to be some type of fungal growth. The room smelled awful, so I tried not to stick around for too long. Entry 2 concerns a trail that I uncovered that was left behind that confirms that there were definitely people living deeper in the system somewhere. The people I talked to initially lied to me and told me that nobody lived under here until I buttered them up and they admitted to the existence of Sector 24. Found multiple signs of life here. Discarded pots and pans, plastic forks, and also trays and old bloody rags that littered the floor. Briefly encountered a man who I have been trying to track ever since my first encounter with him. Incredibly reclusive, and flees whenever I try to interact with him. Can sometimes hear the sound of him sprinting away, as I assume I get closer to his location, and he hears my footsteps. I always find discarded items after I hear him running away. Tracking him is not easy, and with so many strange passageways and similar looking tunnels, it is way too easy to get lost down there. Going too deep is not worth the risk without more information. Have heard loud screams on occasion while down here. Usually incredibly good or all. Not human sounding at all. Doubtful that it's the man I've been tracking. Entry 3 concerns the strange symbols and graffiti that I have been encountering on the walls and floors while exploring down here. The symbols are usually quite similar and that they share a lot of the same elements, with slight variations, usually to do with the image of an eye, with a hand covering the eye, and things such as that. I have found it spray-painted in various places, as well as scratched into the wall forcibly with who knows what. Where they are placed is usually random, but I often find a group of at least one or two of the bulbous mutants gathered in close vicinity to where these symbols have been drawn. Not sure if there is a connection, but it happens more often than not, for it to just be a coincidence. Entry 4 details some strange, unknown pipes that run along the subway, that I presume are designed to pump out waste. These were not put here by whoever built the subway, and we had no idea where exactly any waste would be coming from until we were told about the homeless community in tunnels under here. How they managed to fit pipes themselves and get things to work even slightly, I have absolutely no idea. It is possible that they did not create them and are instead connected to the sewer system and were constructed by our guys, but we have no record of it at all. They don't seem to be working actively and only work at certain points throughout the night. Have never heard them working during the daytime. At random points, they often spew out the strange black bile looking almost tar-like in appearance. The bile is incredibly viscous and sticky, and is not easy to get off. Seems to have a somewhat corrosive effect on rubber, as stepping into it caused it to eat away at the soles of my galoshes. They never ate at the material of any of my other shoes when I tested them. Entry 5 of my journal attempts to detail at least a rudimentary layout of both the subway and Sector 24 my exploration of which I will share after my journal entries. The map I was given by my superiors for the exploration of the abandoned subway systems and tunnels is completely inaccurate and often leads me to brick wall dead ends 
or along the wrong route entirely. It's possible that the map is just outdated and is from when the stations were abandoned, but it seems strange that the abandoned station tunnels would have been worked on after their use was ceased. The architecture under here is strange, and it seems to have no logic to it at all. Space is often wasted, and many narrow paths are put in place that seem to lead nowhere and have no purpose, at least not anymore. The entire place seems to have been constructed in a way to purposefully disorient people so that they cannot find their way deeper in or what they are looking for. Have figured out a rough layout, at least enough to get by for now, but I still struggle occasionally, especially when pursuing the reclusive men. I later discovered that Sector 24 does have a semblance of logic to it, and the provisional map I drew seems to resemble some kind of intricate shape that I cannot remember the name of at present. Entry 6 is my chronicling of the various blocked off passages that I have been encountering that have severely hampered my ability to make progress towards Sector 24. As far as I am aware, there has been no construction on these abandoned subway tunnels for a few years, but there have been some very obvious, recent modifications made. Can't have been put in place more than five years ago. That is my guess as to when the homeless community started to form down here. Steel bars and things, blocking off entire paths and entrances. Sector 24 must be beyond these obstacles. It's possible that there is an entrance or entrances that only the community know about and are using to access Sector 24 while remaining unseen. The only way to access will be to find someone who can show me these paths. My final journal entry of interest is something that I noted a few days into my research. I came upon a disturbing discovery, which I have no rational explanation for. There is a strange recording that plays in those tunnels every single day without fail. Near the blocked off entrances into Sector 24, someone has installed an audio system with built-in speakers that play the same recording every day for approximately one hour before stopping. The audio system appears to be quite old, older than the steel bars that have been put into place at least. The recording that plays is hard to describe. It sounds like the booming voice of a man, yelling something with all of the power in his lungs. The language does not sound like anything I've ever heard before. Can't pinpoint the accent of the man or what country he is from. Sometimes, I can hear muffled cries and growls in the very background of the recording. They are very hard to hear because of the booming voice, but you can hear them faintly in the background, almost like they were picked up by accident. The booming voice from the speakers and the vibrations seem to have some kind of effect on the bulbous mutants that I have mentioned previously and have caused them to pulsate and even cause one to fall from the ceiling and explode from the impact. Luckily, I was a safe distance away from it when this happened. What I will tell you about now was my final day conducting this investigation and the day that I ventured into the deepest part into Sector 24 itself. My resources were starting to run out, our leads were starting to thin, and the patience of my superiors was waning quickly. I was basically given one more day to make significant progress or they were going to choose the nuclear option, not literally. The night before my last day, an unfortunate incident occurred. I woke up to discover that all of my equipment had been looted, with absolutely nothing left for me to use. They took all of my camera equipment, my flashlight, and my backpack. Thankfully, my journal was in my tent beside me, which is how I was able to share the entries with you. I was awoken by the booming of the speakers that seemed to be even louder than usual and were now playing something different to the usual booming voice. There were no discernible words, just noises, shouts, growls, screams, snarls. They all sounded like they were coming from a human, but it was such a strange contrast to the previous broadcast. I was about to give in 
and call it quits on the rest of my research due to the theft, but I was handed a lifeline. I will green text the rest from here on. I get up and don't even bother packing up my tent and the things inside. Technically littering, but whatever. It's not like I'll be reprimanded. The rudimentary map I drew was also doodled in my journal, so I wasn't worried about making my way out. As I started to make the journey, I heard something that caught my attention. I heard the rattling of something metal before there was a loud bang. Sounded like the same metal thing had been dropped onto the ground. I quickly, but quietly, made my way towards the source. I wasn't worried at all. The only person who I had encountered thus far was the man I was tracking before, and I had a strong hunch that it was him. Figured it was probably him who stole my stuff too. I rounded the corner of the tunnel and I noticed him slumped up against a wall. I was a little cautious of going up to him as I hadn't had a proper interaction with him, so I didn't know how he would react towards me. I crept towards him and as I'm about to reach him, his eyes shoot open and he takes a massive breath. He wasn't an old man, looked to be maybe in his thirties. His clothes were ragged and didn't fully cover his chest, which had a huge mass of scars. I asked him if he was okay, but he didn't respond right away. He was looking at me, but it's like he was looking straight through me. I half wondered if he was mute or perhaps the people down here spoke their own language, but he did eventually respond to me in English. He told me that he thought he was dead, that he died in his dream and thought he would never wake up again. I asked him what the fuck he was doing down here, and why he always ran away from me. He told me he lives in a community, and if they ever found out that he'd talked to anyone from the surface, he would be punished. Said he didn't care anymore, because they kicked him out. Something about a dispute, about who should be the leader, and about how people have been treated there recently. Told me that a lot of friends of his had been going missing, over the course of the last few months, and that the people he thinks are responsible won't tell him what they did with them. Thinks they murdered them and dumped them somewhere in the Sector 24 tunnels to stop him from gaining more support to become a leader in the community. I was shocked, but I sensed an opportunity. I told him all about why I was down here and what I was researching. I told him about what the government was looking to do and that driving them out could lead to them being punished, and the fates of his friends would be investigated and would be found out. He was hesitant at first. He still had over people who lived there who he was okay with and didn't want to ruin the place for all the homeless people who had nowhere else to go. On the other hand, he told me he was concerned that more people would be abused and killed eventually if it was allowed to go on. He said that they were starting to let people who didn't follow every rule they put into place to starve and would eventually kick them out back to the surface. After spending a lot of time talking to him, a few hours by my count, and gaining his trust, he agreed to escort me into Sector 24 through one of the lesser used entrances that he knew about. He told me that he would guide me in and show me the way to their camp, but would not go any further than that or assist in anything that the government was going to do. He was determined to have no violence. I asked him if it was today that they kicked him out of the community, but he told me it had been about 10 days since he last set foot in there, but was still avoiding people just in case he could resolve everything peacefully. I pull out my journal and show him the map I drew, and he told me that I got most of it right, aside from a few of the dead ends I had mucked down. I asked him what he meant, and he just told me that not all of the dead ends are actually dead ends. He brings me to the end of one of the tunnels, near one of the abandoned ones, really deep in, where there's just a dead end. Just a pure brick wall. He brings me to the end of it, and to the left, and starts taking some fucking bricks out of the wall. I'm just shocked, as he takes out enough bricks near to the ground, it opens up to a really small tunnel that you can crawl through. I'm reluctant to make the journey, 
because it looks like I could easily get stuck in there, even with my small frame. He tells me he'll lead the way, and I decided fuck it, I'm way too deep in to quit now. If I could get some crucial information on my last day, and save my superiors some massive manpower costs, then they would love me forever, and it would be good for my pockets. The crawl through the tunnel is agonizing, and I can barely breathe in and out fully, because the walls are so tight around me. There's also some weird smelling black sludge that's a couple of millimeters high that we are basically dragging our stomachs over, and I dread to think what it is. I'm pretty sure it's not shit, but maybe that was just an optimistic thought. We finally crawl out at the other side, and the place is eerie as fuck. It's another subway tunnel, one I'd never seen before, and there are like lanterns hanging all the way down the tunnel. They don't provide a ton of light, but it's definitely better than nothing. As we are walking down, I notice that there's a ton more of the symbols that I saw before, all over the walls. Not the same as before though. The symbols are all seemingly random, and also have arrows and other markers next to them. Think that it could possibly be a code or a language that they use, but I can't really work it out. There's also more clusters of those mutants, more than I've ever fucking seen before, hanging from the ceilings like stalacites, but thicker, and are clumped together in corners of the place. The guy leads me deeper and deeper into the tunnels, as we just make awkward small talk throughout. He stops me suddenly. I try to ask him what's up, but he just shushes me. I clam up instantly can hear something coming from further down the tunnel, very faintly. He tells me that down there is the door to the community, and that we shouldn't go any further. I tell him to at least show me the door, but he outright refuses. Whatever we could hear has seriously freaked him out. The sound grows louder, slowly but surely. It's a fucking snarl. Hear a loud foot, and the guy basically shits himself tells me that we have to go now, and that this is a bad idea. Tells me it's probably them, and that they know we're down here. Tells me that they've been growing more violent lately, and will probably kill him on sight for bringing an outsider here. Gee, thanks for telling me that now. The snarl is growing louder and louder, and we hear a creaking sound start to crescendo as the snarl stops at the end of the tunnel that we were in, but keeps its volume. I ask him if he took my flashlight earlier, and he's like, shit, yeah, take it. I take out the flashlight and flick it on. Nothing up there, except for more of the bulbous mutant things. We start backing up. As we do, the snarl turns into a sudden roar that causes all of the bulbous mutants to shake. I thought that they were all going to explode with the sheer power of the sound. As we are backpedaling, one of them falls from the ceiling. Not shaped like a stalacite, it's fat and fleshy. It falls straight onto the homeless guy's head, and I manage to avoid it. It doesn't explode on contact, it's just fucking surrounding his head. His head is like, inside of it, like he's fucking wearing it like a hat. I am really fucking grossed out. He is fucking screaming like his life depends on it. The thing is vibrating crazily from the force of his screams. He is trying desperately to claw it off of his head, but his hands can only go through it, and he can't shake it off. In what seems like forever, but was only a few moments, his hands droop to his sides, and he drops to his knees. I am confused and scared. I have no idea what the fuck is happening. The thing is just vibrating on his head, and his whole body starts to convulse. I start to step back towards the way we came. I just want to get out of there and go home. His body stops convulsing, and he is still, just for a moment. Then he starts to rise to his feet. No, 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 no. He starts walking towards me. Not like a normal person would. It's like, he has to fight his own body and legs 
to get them to move. He is like bow-legged and is almost dragging his feet along the floor. I start to run as fast as I fucking can back down the tunnel. I am not sticking around for whatever the fuck this is. I reach the hole where we crawled through in record time, and then I start to hear it. Thumping. It sounds like thunder. Someone is fucking sprinting towards me. I force myself into the crawl space and try not to think about the tight space. I drag myself through as fast as I can. Right as I am at the end, I can hear snarling at the other end of the crawl space where I came in. It's that same fucking snarling. I jump to my feet and frantically start putting back the bricks as best as I could where they originally were. As I was putting them back, I caught a glimpse. A brief glimpse. It was the homeless guy's face. His eyes were a luminous yellow. His face looked gray, and his facial expression looked strained. I made my way back to the surface as fast as I possibly could, and booked myself into a nearby motel. I did not report back properly for a few days. I did not even have the strength to talk. I told them about the location of Sector 24. I told them how I found it. I told them about the entrance and about the politics of the place. They could tell I was shaken up and asked me if there was anything else that I might be leaving out. I told them that they would not believe me, but I explained the situation with the homeless guy and the bulbous mutants anyway. My superior just nodded at me, got up, and walked out of the room. I was paid very generously, as I thought I would be for my discovery, and my investigation was promptly shut down. Last I heard, they were sending people down to clear it up. That is all the information I have for you, unfortunately, X. I have no idea if they've cleared it yet, or what else they found. Just typing this stuff out is making me sweat. I can answer questions if you have them, but I think I probably went into enough detail just for this post. Be me, nine years old boy, living in the rural part of the country in a godforsaken town. In my neighborhood, there was a house, three houses down from mine. Normal house, a daddy and mommy and their son lived there. Word on the street was that the house was haunted. Just a myth though, nobody actually saw anything. One night, we all wake up to screams. It seemed like the dad went crazy and snapped against his family. Neighbors called the police. They arrived later at the scene, but there wasn't much they could have done. The dad killed his wife and son and then hung himself on a beam in the backyard. The very next day, the kids from the neighborhood and me go to see the house for spooks and giggles. It seemed as if the house had gained weight or had swollen. The walls were very clearly inflated outwards. From that day, we started calling it the balloon house. Months later, another family comes to live there. A young, newly married couple with no kids. They didn't last there for long, though. After not hearing from them for several days, a neighbor went in to check on the house. He finds the woman in the master bed, strangled to death. And her husband, again, appears to be hanging from a beam in the backyard. Mind you, on this point, the reputation of the house was well known. Nobody lasted there for long. Several people lived there for three months, six tops. The one that held the record for the least time living there lasted only two weeks. The last family that I remember living there was this old lady and his son. Same story, a few months go by and the lady seemed to go crazy. Says that she can hear the walls talking. One day, she can't take it anymore and leaves. Her son stays. Only two weeks later, he takes his own life inside the house. 
the house keeps getting fatter. Years pass. The property is bought by a local taxi driver. I even remember his name. Vladimir. He would be about 35 or 36 years old. Vladimir decided to demolish the house and build a new house from the foundations. No more balloon house. When his new house was ready, Vladimir goes to live there. He had managed to live there for about a year when they found him dead. Hung, this time from a tree planted in the backyard, in the same place where the beams were. And that's all. I don't know what else happened since I left town, but I still remember the police do not trespass tape and the guy hanging from the tree.